For our last lecture this week, I want to tell the story of James Somerset. It's a great story and proof that the fortitude of one individual can have enormous repercussions beyond what any of the immediate historical actors themselves understand. In James Somerset's story, we see how inequality dominated early modern law, but also how legal process, dull, boring procedure, could both protect real liberty and advance abstract notions of equality. James Somerset was born in Western Africa. He was born free and had been kidnapped by slave traders as a boy. Thereafter, he was destined for the coastal slave markets where he was weighed, measured, and sold to slave traders. Millions suffered Somerset's fate. The vast majority of the 10 million or so men and women, mainly men, who fell victim to the Atlantic slave trade were destined for sugar islands, tobacco farms, or rice swamps. Their bodies were stolen and their labor appropriated in a massive system of plantation production that brought valuable staple crops to the European consumer market. North America was a latecomer to the Atlantic slave trade and slave economy. Importations of slaves did not begin in earnest there until the 18th century, although when they did, they would bring more than a half a million slaves to American shores. Nonetheless, slaves arrived in North American colonies from the very start. Additionally, Many of those who arrived in North America who were not outright slaves were not themselves free, and many did not come willingly. We have discussed last week the prevalence of unfree labor in the colony in Virginia. The story of Anne Orthwood, in particular, helps us understand how indentured servants were like ser excuse me indentured servants were like slaves in certain ways, but unlike them in other ways. One thing we did not discuss last week, but is important to understand, is what happened to servants who ran away. Servants ran away from their indentures all the time. When they did, masters had a common law right of recapture. This sprang from the common law of persons, and really from the common law of master and servant. It was a largely unwritten law that governed personal relations. The right of recaption meant that the master had a right to seize the servant wherever he found him and forcibly return him to service. The only restriction on this was that the master not breach the public peace. It is probably worth pointing out here that the authority of the master over the servant and the right of recaption applied to wives and children as well as masters and servants. Absconding children and wives could be pursued by the paterfamilias and seized by him. And of course, local authorities would be obligated to help the master retrieve his servant, or the husband his wife, or the father his child. This was a common law right, and as such was part of the unwritten law, and it was very widely enforced. Also oftentimes, by the way, leaves no record. Nonetheless, it's also part of positive law. By positive law here, we mean, of course, written law. When the New England colonies confederated in 1643, part of their intercolonial agreement was to return fugitive servants upon the production of a magistrate certificate or, quote, other due proof, end quote. The burden of proof in such cases was effectively on the servant. Virtually every colony, for instance, had a pass law. And this meant that anybody traveling abroad, literally, by the way, this means just traveling to the next town, had to carry some proof of who they were. If you were traveling without a pass and you could not prove who you were, you would be jailed and colony authorities would begin looking for your master. Masters who retrieved their servants uh, in colonial America would also discipline them in court. The colonies passed statutes that penalized servants who ran away from their masters by lengthening the period of their indentures. In short, the legal system imposed a hierarchical system of labor on America, and servants were kept strictly in their place by common law, by statute law, by and by the officers who enforced it, as well as the masters who enjoyed its benefits. This was the world that James Somerset found himself in. He was sold as a boy to a man named Charles Stewart in 1749. Stewart groomed him for service, and the precocious James Somerset proved a valuable one. Stewart, a merchant who peddled goods up and down the North American coast, rewarded his servant with expensive gifts. Somerset's name pops up in the records of the era, in letters and diaries wherever he visited. He made much an impression on people, as did, by the way, his master.
Now, in our story here, here are the major players that we will look at. James Somerset and Charles Stewart, uh, whom I've already mentioned, but also a man named Granville Sharp and the Lord Chief Justice, uh, the Earl of Mansfield. In 1769, Charles Stewart arrived in London with James. He conducted business there for two years before James ran away. Charles was none too happy. He hired two men who found James Somerset, seized him, put him in irons, and locked him aboard the Anne and Mary, a ship bound for the slave market of Jamaica. At this point, it appeared that James's story was going to end the same way it did for many of the slaves who regularly traveled with their British masters from the New World to London and back again. But this is where James' story diverts from the norm. James had befriended many in the free black community, and they had some industrious and even powerful allies among London's anti-slavery crowd. Now, just to be clear, there was no real anti-slavery movement in the sense of a large and organized group of people at this time. But several people with strong anti-slavery convictions had been loudly making trouble for slaveholders. Chief among them was a man named Granville Sharp, who had published a treatise in 1769, I apologize if this is so blurry, but this is the title, A Representation of the Injustice and Dangerous Tendency of Tolerating Slavery or of Admitting the Least Claim of Private Property in the Persons of Men in England. This, by the way, is a completely normal 18th century title. They were always incredibly long and incredibly descriptive. I'll repeat it again. A Representation of the Injustice and Dangerous Tendency of Tolerating Slavery or of Admitting the Least Claim of Private Property in the Persons of Men, comma, in England. So this is, and, and then it actually goes on in four parts, and uh, there's even a description of the four parts, which is technically part of the title. Sharp's treatise was the literary equivalent of a canon aimed at the powerful West Indies planters. And the West Indies planters were wealthy and powerful. <clears throat> Their wealth clearly came on the backs of slave labor. It was the linchpin of everything that they had. They regularly took and traded slaves through the ports of Liverpool and London, and their immense fortunes depended upon a mass of legal and clerical work in accounting and insurance and merchandising that was conducted almost exclusively in London. Sharp's treatise essentially called this whole enterprise illegal. Sharp's argument, in a nutshell, was that slavery could not exist by English law. To prove this, he drew a line of precedence. He began with Magna Carta's famous chapter 39, which declared that no freeman would be imprisoned except by the law of the land. He then pointed out that Parliament of Edward III in 1346 had extended Magna Carta's provisions to everyone in the realm. Finally, the 1679 Habeas Corpus Act guaranteed that any person could sue out the writ of habeas corpus. If all these things were true, reasoned Sharp, then slavery was not logically consistent with the ancient venerable common law. So to be clear here, he's, he's trying to argue that slavery doesn't exist in English law, and he draws this line of precedence going back to Magna Carta to prove it. And I haven't really gone through the, the uh, full scope of his arguments. Obviously, this treatise is more, more sophisticated than I can let on here. The important thing to understand is that he's making a fundamentally conservative argument. The common law should be what it has always been. The common law does not recognize slavery. Therefore, slavery itself is illegitimate. The West Indies planters scoffed at this. They had in their possession plenty to rebut Granville Sharp. Considering, consider the following three pieces of information. One, Parliament had passed statutes that governed the slave trade, so it had in fact recognized slavery. This practical recognition may not have recognized slavery in England proper, but the implication was likely enough. Slavery was tolerated all throughout the empire. Two, English courts had recognized slavery as existing in the colonies and had found ways to enforce slave contracts in England. Granted, judges had been forced to strain logic or insist on specific kinds of pleading in order to maintain the fiction that slaves did not exist in England. But nonetheless, they still did this. And notice, by the way, by the beginning of the 18th century, judges were already saying, slavery doesn't exist here, so we can't enforce a slave contract. And one of the ways that they get around this in the 1705 case is that judges instruct the attorneys, you can't sue, you've pleaded incorrectly. So what you have to do is go back and plead that the slave sale took place in a jurisdiction where a slave sale is allowed, then you can plead the contract, which they do, and the case goes forward. Third the West Indies planters had the York Talbot opinion. This was an opinion by two of England's leading legal minds, and it stated the following. One, slaves did not become free by traveling to England. Two, 
English law did not affect the master's property right in slaves, even if that right was not acquired by English law. And three, baptism did not free a slave. The York Talbot opinion had been solicited by the West Indies planters in 1729, so well in advance of any of these cases. And although it had no legal force, it's not a pronouncement by a court, it has no binding authority, it nonetheless is a strongly reasoned and powerful defense of slaveholders' right to travel to England with their slaves. And by the way, it was written by two people who were holding offices. One is attorney general, no, excuse me, not attorney one is Lord Chancellor, uh, and the other would be a High Court judge. So I mean, we're talking, in other words, about, about people whose legal opinions were well respected. Now let's return to James Somerset, imprisoned on board the Anne and Mary. Friends of his sought out Granville Sharp's help, and he assembled a legal team. Then he sued out a writ of habeas corpus in Somerset's name. The writ of habeas corpus, we will recall, is a remedy for unjust detention. But that word is a little misleading. By unjust, the writ asks, is the detention according to the correct form of law? So the writ tests not the reason for detention, but rather the form of the detention. Take the simple example. Let's say someone is framed for murder. A court issues an arrest warrant. He is arrested and taken to jail. He sues out a writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus commands the jailer to bring the prisoner before the judge who issued it and explain why he is detained. The jailer complies, brings forward the prisoner. The judge in that case would not ask the question, is this person guilty of murder? But rather, was he jailed according to correct legal process? The answer in that case would be yes. The suspect was jailed on an arrest warrant and therefore by proper legal process. Even if the judge knows that the suspect is not guilty of murder, this is not the question that he is being asked and not the question, therefore, that he will answer. This is what the Court of King's Bench in 1772 confronted when it issued a writ of habeas corpus in the case of James Somerset and Charles Stewart. The writ commanded Somerset's detainers to state by what authority they held him. The answer came back on the writ from the captain of Anne and Mary. I hold James Somerset because he is the legal property of Charles Stewart, and Stewart wants me to hold him here until we sail out of the realm. The Chief Justice of King's Bench was Lord Mansfield, a celebrated jurist, depicted here. He had but one thing to consider. Was the detention according to law? Several lawyers appeared for both sides, and it became clear quite quickly that both sides wanted to use this as a test case. Somerset's lawyers wanted the Chief Justice to rule that slavery was against the common law and thus void. This is, uh, these are the lawyers assembled by Granville Sharp. The West Indies planters wanted the Lord Chief Justice to follow the reasoning of the York Talbot opinion and secure their property when in England. Lord Chief Justice Mansfield tried to get the two sides to come to an out-of-court agreement. When this did not happen, he leveled a final warning. Fiat ustidia ruat caelum, let justice be done though the heavens may fall. Now, this, there's a lot to this case that does appear apocryphal, particularly when we read later reports written by abolitionists, but I do believe that this is precisely what happened. Mansfield was frustrated that the two sides would not resolve the case, which is what the common law is supposed to do. He was aware that they both wanted a larger legal statement, and it put him in something of a bind. And this, in fact, is precisely how we have to read his opinion. So I can completely see him at the last hearing before he must make his ruling, saying, if you will not come together, then let justice be done, though the heavens may fall. Fiat justitia ruat caelum. It was not uncommon, of course, for justices to speak in Latin from the bench, so the Latin phrase may be a little more dramatic today, but it certainly is, is what happened. Now, you all know how the case turns out. You have the opinion that is in the law reports, but I would like to contextualize Mansfield opinion in Somerset v. Stewart a little bit further for our discussion this week. First, it is important to understand that the justices did not write their opinions. Instead, they spoke from the bench when they gave their ruling. Any record we have of the judges' rulings is dependent upon the reporters who were present and who recorded their words and then published them. This is, why, why the, by the way, why most of the reports go by the reporter's name during this time rather than by the judges' names. Second, the written opinion was limited by the facts of the case the jurisdiction of the court, and the form of law under which it arose. When you consider these limitations, and here we are learning how to read a case properly, 
what is the legal command that comes out of Somerset v. Stewart? What was Mansfield really saying? Was this a conservative or a liberal decision? Was it an expansive one? Was it a restrictive one? These are uh, questions that have been posed by scholars uh, who still argue about whether Justice Mansfield was issuing a very narrow ruling intended not to offend anybody or whether it was a triumph for freedom. So people disagreed about this in the 1770s, and they continue to disagree about it today. We'll discuss further the effect of the case uh, in regards to the United States Constitution and to, uh, for that matter, American law throughout the case. It turns out to be an absolutely important one.